Sleepy bell. Hey, and we get a lot a of bunch them. of other advocates. A lot of them, um, and then we could talk about how to best address any issues. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, it's Zach Sarkis here. Um, I'm the founder and executive director of New York Hemp Lab. Um, we This is our monthly uh, hemp industry roundtable. And this is, I think this is our fourth or fifth month at this point, our second month for, through this Zoom portal. Um, hemp Lab is a registered 501c3. We're member supported. Um, we have a few of our members on the call today. Um, we got Mike Kincaid, Richard Glazer, uh, Dan Horowitz of Shooty Hammer Mill, uh, Lisa of Boylan Code, um, Steve Latier of Forefathers Innovation, and Tom of Singer Farm Naturals. Um, really thank you guys for your support. Helps us keep going through, and we're happy to continue to bring this stuff forward. Um, Hemp Labs focuses on providing educational services and events for uh, stakeholders across the industry, and we're here to help you all, and we want to keep knowing uh, that what we're offering is, is, is helping everyone in their decision making uh, moving forward. Um, we got a couple, uh, yeah, really just, uh, we're lucky to have the group we have today who are speaking to us. Um, we're looking at the new CBD extract bill in the first part of this conversation and then beginning to uh, understand what opportunities are available for the agricultural community for, through the COVID relief bill. Um, are, I'm going to ask that uh, everyone keep their microphones muted. If you have any questions, share them through the, the chat box uh, and we'll do our best to answer them. Um, I'll serve as the moderator for today. I uh, hope you all enjoyed that introductory kind of networking. We want to try to explore to make this more dynamic. So these breakout groups is like a way to, to learn who's in our community and get a better idea of how they can plug into to your business or your vision moving forward in this industry. Um, so to start, we're going to look at the CBD extract bill that is about to come into play. Um, really excited and grateful to have uh, Assemblywoman Donna Lopardo. She's of the 123rd District, uh, which is the city of Binghamton and the town of Vestal and Union. Uh, she has served that community since 2004. Um, she's really been at the forefront of supporting the agricultural community in general, uh, done a ton of work downstate, and really been one of the uh, the individuals at the forefront of pushing sensible uh, hemp legislation that's really, I think, farmer facing. And so uh, she's a huge ally and champion for, for our cause here. Um, you, uh, just recently, she's been appointed uh, as the chair for the assembly of the agricultural committee. Um, she also sits on the higher education committee, the economic development committees, the rules committee, and the transportation committee. So has a plethora of background and insight and really can tell us how uh, this bill has come to the table and what the, what we've seen. And then we also are supported uh, by Alan Gandelman, who is the founder of the New York State Cannabis Growers and Processors Association. Um, he also is a, uh, he owns Main Street Farms, uh, is co-owner of Head and & Heel and the New York State, uh, was it Hemp Oil? New York Hemp Oil Company. Um, and his organization through New York State Cannabis Growers and Processors Association have really helped, again, shape this bill from the, uh, the perspective of the cultivator and the processor. So we have two really great insights um, into what is at the table today. Um, and again, if you have any questions, please send them into the chat and we'll start, uh, Donna, we'll start with just a few words about yeah, how it's come to be. And um, then we'll do a little bit of back and forth from there. And then at the tail end, we'll, we'll look sure. at yeah, the COVID bill uh, through uh, with uh, Jason Klimek of Boiling Code, who's also a board member for Hemp Lab. So we'll look at mm -hmm. that about three quarters of the way through. So thank you sure. all so much. And thank you, Donna. Yeah. Oh, hey, Anthony. You said nice to see me wherever you are on there. Um, so how we got here, that's a, you know, their books will be written when we tell the story about how we moved New York State in this direction. 
the first bill uh, I passed was back in 2014. The first seeds went in the ground in 2016. Uh, you know, I passed numerous bills to get us to this place, but scroll ahead to 2019. And uh, to be honest, uh, hundreds of permits went out the door. And I don't think uh, we fully appreciated the fact at the time that three quarters or more of the permits would be issued to grow what we now refer to as hemp extracts like CBD. Um, this created um, an oversupply, to be honest, an oversupply that we thought would be addressed uh, by a robust uh, CBD or hemp extract bill. And that bill was passed in uh, June of 2019, but had some serious legal flaws in it. Had to come back and do chapter amendments, working with Alan and many of you who are on this call, to uh, put together something that was more workable. And we can go into some examples. It really almost doesn't matter at this point. Uh, but the bill uh, passed, uh, I believe, in January with the changes that we wanted, and now goes into effect. Is tomorrow May 1st? I've lost track of the days and time. <laughs> yes. Is today Thursday or Friday? Anyway, on May 1st, the health department takes this over. Um, you know, not all states have struggled with this, um, the difference between the fiber and grain crop and what we now refer to as hemp extracts. Uh, our Department of Agri Markets was never comfortable uh, dealing with the extract side of this. They weren't comfortable with the dietary supplement idea. They certainly weren't comfortable with managing uh, what we had hoped would be the place where many of the, the excess supply or the supply that we grew uh, would go into food and beverage. They were never comfortable with this, never were going to be able to do it. Uh, they're, um, you know, honestly, grain specialists. This is not their thing. So we came up with a plan that the new department of uh, the Office of Cannabis Management would be the perfect place to manage our medical program, what we had assumed by now would be our legal, legalized uh, marijuana program, and the hemp extracts piece. That never came to be for a million reasons we could talk about some other time. So um, we came up with this last minute plan. Let's give it to the health department temporarily until we sort out the Office of Cannabis Management. In fact, if this uh, COVID situation hadn't hit us, uh, I was advancing a plan to create the Office of Cannabis Management anyway. You know, let's just get it set up. Let's do, ma let's do medical, let's do, um, the extracts program, and then when we can wrap our minds around doing uh, legalization, um, you know, we would even be ready. We would be stacked up. We would have something in place. Of course, that didn't work out. Again, we could wring our hands over it. We still we haven't given up. Majority leader is still gung ho on legalization, but here we are. Health department takes it over tomorrow. The goal right now is to. Um, I've already been in conversation to start drafting the regulations. Uh, we're going to, I think, Alan, re-engage and some others. I think Mark is on the call and some others. I think we're going to re-engage the, uh, the work group that we had originally put together to review these regs, um, hopefully in June. And they go into place in January. Uh, the major motivation for me personally uh, was consumer protection on the front end to put in place very robust labeling standards uh, to make sure that anything that is sold in New York State is labeled properly so people understood what they were purchasing. Uh, also, um, to sort out this uh, food and beverage situation, I think the science is now caught up. I think we've got some research to point to so we know we're not just spitballing some milligram. I think we have a better idea what we're doing. Uh, there was some concerns about toxicity and other matters. So if we can get the health department to, to peel off a little bit of their focus onto this, and that's going to be our challenge right now because they're all COVID all the time as as am I I can I can I'm surprised I'm able to put this many words together on a different topic to be honest um, but that's our goal that's our goal we want to protect consumers and we certainly want to do something with the supply um, it's very painful for me uh, I've been personally blamed for farm losses um, I had one uh, uh, farmer recently write to me and say uh, that we listened to you and we thought this stuff would quote fly off the shelves and if there's anything i think we've learned from watching this COVID impact on the food supply is that cbd doesn't just leap off out of the field onto the shelves we need a whole supply chain of activity in between and if, if there's one thing i'd like to 
communicate. And this may not be particularly popular, but I have found that consumers are very interested in these products, but I think we may have to have a good long hard look at our pricing structure and, and what consumers can actually afford to pay while we are building up this interest. I think we, I don't want to say we oversold it, but I feel like I, I certainly hyped up how available it would be, how good it would be, and then consumers tried it and then couldn't afford it. Um, and I've seen some companies sort of adjust their, their model uh, to that. So a uh, long story short, um, this has been a six year quest. Uh, many of you have been very solid participants and real good supporters. Um, and you know, you, as many of you have heard me say that, you know, we were building the airplane as we were flying it, but that's, we're getting a little tired of doing that. And it's a little dangerous to be honest. And I do think some early risk takers got hurt in the process because A, we didn't anticipate as many people would grow CBD as they did. Uh, I certainly didn't fully understand how much oil you get out of one acre of CBD. That was a real shock when they finally explained to me how much comes out of one acre. Uh, and we also want to strongly recommend people explore grain and fiber. Uh, lots of interest coming, especially in the new economy we're going to be rebuilding. People are going to look to hemp not only for you know, help and relaxation and all the health benefits, but people are gonna to look to hemp for alternative plastics and alternative textiles, trying to move away from our petrochemical world and you know, come up with something more regenerative, uh, not only for our economy, but for our farmers. So um, thanks for everything you're doing. I am going to be listening to Alan and all of you. If you flag an issue that you see as a problem with the regs we're establishing that we can do without having to revisit the bill, I'll be taking a lot of notes and. You know, we want this to succeed for, for everybody's case and very timely right now, given what we're experiencing with this um, COVID problem for our economy. So thanks everybody. Yeah, thank you, Donna. Mm -hmm. So Alan, if you uh, wouldn't mind picking up the torch and we can begin to look at some more of, um, re start reading between the lines. You know, one of the first opening lines of, well, it's like line 19 and 20 is hemp extracts can only be sourced from authorized New York state industrial hemp producers. Um, so looking at how, like, uh, where are we coming from? What should we expect? Uh, how is this going to be different than what's on the table today? You're a processor yourself. So I think you can really speak from experience and what to expect. And I think uh, there's a handful of processors on this uh, recording today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the original intent of the bill was to have a closed New York State kind of hemp supply chain, uh, an ecosystem and try to model it after the farm brewery bill. Um, I think that's one of those things that Donna was saying was kind of a legal mm -hmm. issue because um, it was never our real intent to stop interstate commerce. We just wanted a safe, traceable supply chain. So that was kind of our first attempt to do it. That didn't work in the chapter amendments that's been changed. So processors or whoever can buy hemp from out of state, it just has to meet our standards. Mm -hmm. And so that will get laid out in regs later. Um, there was a lot of out-of-state people very upset about that provision, um, but a lot of New York State farmers kind of happy about that provision. So, you know, I think we're still in that balancing act of how we're going to um, eat up New York State supply. Like Donna is saying, a lot of people grew hemp, um, you know, early on when there was probably about 100 licenses given out our association did recommend uh, slowing down or vetting some of the applicants a little bit more in depth, but, you know, to Ag and Market's point, they didn't, they didn't want to be in the position of picking winners and losers, um, mm -hmm. you know, and that's completely, you know, that's probably the right approach. We knew there would probably be an oversupply because in marijuana and cannabis and commodities in general. I mean, that's just what happens in new industries. People get really excited. No one knows what the consumer market can bear and there's an oversupply. I think a lot of people, not just the New York state farmers, but the large uh, multinational corporations that were getting into hemp, you know, they also took really big bets that the FDA would allow CBD and food and beverages. And they started contracting farms all over New York, all over the country. And then, um, you know, it just didn't work out that way. And the FDA has been really, really slow. Uh, and then COVID came in and that put a kind of a grinding halt to everything. But, um, you know, I'm pretty optimistic that the supply and demand market will balance out. And there's people who 
you know, like Donna was saying, they just didn't realize how much oil comes out of an acre. And they're like, I'm going to grow a hundred acres. And it's like, you could just grow like one to five and do very well as like a diversified income. You don't need to all of a sudden change your entire life to be like a hemp farmer overnight, you know? So a lot of people did that. And that was just, that's really risky. It's just really risky business practices. You know, as a farmer, we're a vegetable farm. We also grow hemp. We are not giving up on vegetables. We're just adding another crop to the rotation. And as our cannabis association has tried to explain to many farmers who call us, don't go all in on one crop. I mean, if you haven't learned anything from, you know, monoculture and corn and soy, like it's just not the best thing to do. It's good to be diversified. Um, And so, you know, now we're dealing with those issues. And I think this year we've seen a lot of people really scaling back. So hopefully 2020 and 2021, uh, the market will level out and we'll have a little bit more stability from the supply side. Um, so some other changes we're looking at, you know, um, obviously we're talking about implementation for 2021. Um, mm-hmm. but one of the big questions is Delta nine or total THC. Um, there's also, uh, is, so we're looking at, uh, go ahead. So, I mean, the USDA is not totally done with their final regs. They want to go total THC. New York is still in the research phase uh, up until October 31st of Delta 9. Yep. So um, one of the reasons, like Donna was saying, it's so important for us to create the Office of Cannabis Management and have a closed ecosystem because I think we all know the difference, the difference in the 0.3 total or Delta 9, whether it goes one way or the other. It's not actually a harm to consumer safety. If we go Delta nine only and someone's crop is 0.5, you know, it's getting turned into extract anyway, the consumer still won't be able to get high. Mm -hmm. And so those arbitrary classifications could really hurt the industry. And one of our goals was to have the closed ecosystem under the office of cannabis management, kind of push the FDA and the USDA off and we can make safe products that at the end of the day are under total 0.3 THC. You know, I think we've all known as growers to go from total THC to 0.3 to 0.4. I mean, it can happen. It does happen. Should anyone have to destroy their crops because of that? No. So we really need the USDA to wisen up a little bit on those regs. Um, And I think hopefully, you know, this fall we'll see if they could pull that off. Yeah. Um, How many different licenses do we forecast in the hemp ecosystem? So obviously this outlines the cannabinoid grower, cannabinoid manufacturer, and cannabinoid extractor, um, but we've talked about a couple others as well. So I think, um, you know, like the Department of Health right now is taking this over and looking at the regs. Um, We'll have the growers. That's going to be by the Department of Ag Markets. And then what we'll have is probably the extractors, which there already is. Um, Department of Health is going to have to kind of come in and do better in terms of the inspections, the GMP certifications, et cetera. Then there'll be the manufacturers. So those people could buy from the extractors, turn it into products, and then sell them to the retailers. And the retailers could be anyone, you know, all the uh, grocery stores or farmers market vendors, whoever it is, will just need to register as a retailer so that there is a way for the department to track the supply chain. Um, we're not foreseeing and we're not hoping this is some kind of like super intense, hard situation like a dispensary. We just, just a database, just how they do with any other, uh, you know, right. a lot of other products. So that's kind of what we're foreseeing. Um, you know, hopefully Department of Health can pull this through by the end of this year. I mean, they're super taxed right now, obviously. And the longer COVID goes on, the longer this will probably take a back seat, unfortunately. Um, And that's why we've always hoped that whatever the Department of Health does now will eventually go into Office of Cannabis Management, because that's really where we can create a good program from the ground up. Yeah, absolutely. And just for we, do you anticipate as we're building out regulation that it makes sense to start building the framework for you know a distribution license as like a wholesale license and a retail license differentiation, or do you see that being forecasted once uh, 
yeah, OCM is established. Yeah, we won't see that now. That would be more of an OCM for an adult use program. Um, just because distribution already exists for food and health supplements, I don't think there's a need to create a distribution license or channel for CBD or extract products. Um, you know, and our goal eventually is for the adult use program to have the micro licenses. And I think, um, you know, hopefully once we have that micro license program and farmers could be really their own distributors and their own retailers, I think that's where we'll really see big wins for, you know, the farming community. Hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, now looking at what's existing requirements for, uh, let's labeling is a big thing Donna brought up and that we're all well aware of. And we know that and that's a really foundation, uh, foundational point for integrity in the supply chain. Uh, what's different from today versus what we should expect uh, next year this time? You mean like in the marketplace or? Um, uh, with regards to the labeling requirements, like, and maybe that's something that still needs to be built out and that's part of the work group, for example. Um, but I'm curious if there is, is a drastic uh, expectation in, in differentiation of labeling uh, for let's say tincture. I think the bill was pretty clear on labeling in terms of dosage, you know, milligram per dosage, uh, QR codes with third party test results on, you know, for full panel, uh, metals, pesticides, you know, et cetera. Um, and the source, you know, I think one thing that we would like to see is labels saying what state the CBD was from or the product was manufactured in. And is that, and so really that's maybe with the primary difference is the, the, the state, like as you were already printing labels today and you had to change them for an, mm -hmm. in anticipation, that's one of the big differences is where it's coming from, for example. Yeah, I think so. We'll see how that translates to regs, but yeah, yeah. that was always part of the intent. Hmm. Yeah, and that was one of the things that, um, you know, at the very end of, the revisions I was looking at last night, it's looking at the, the hemp work group that Donna brought up. Um, who would you imagine be, is there already a hemp group, work group? And if so, who, who's on it? Or if not, uh, who would you imagine to be uh, the best to, to, to really inform this? You're asking me that? Uh, either or. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, all right. Alan, are you on the work group? Alan's not on the work group. We may have to revisit this to bring some more people who have come come along. But uh, I know Mark is on there. Some other people uh, I think on this call are, are on the work group. Um, I think the work work group uh, will more or less look to be more of a review body. I mean, we know what the direction we're heading in. I think we just want to flag uh, things that are just not going to be workable. So I, I think you know we could potentially expand it, but. Um, I'm thinking, you know, Alan may very well want to be involved with that. Uh, clearly, he's been involved in this from the start. So, yeah, we've had an existing work group for a long time. It hasn't met in a while. Yep, great. Well, thank you. It'd probably be good to get Department of Health on that work group. Oh, well. they are. No, they're there. They, they were there right from the beginning. Great. Um, so one question that came from Mark, uh, what is the latest thinking on the October 31st sunset on the 2014 program? Uh, it seems that the needed COVID focus in the state will delay future st hemp program development. So do the rules automatically change to the 2018 USDA rules? Um, and uh, I met did, Wait a minute, didn't we have to opt in? I mean, New York, I thought opted not to put in a plan. Isn't that right? Alan, can you elaborate and on that? You're right, Don. We, I think at the moment, um, Department of Ag opted to not put in a plan. The question is what happens what on happens? October 31st date? I don't think anyone knows, <laughs> to be honest, Mark. I think uh, the Department of Ag is hoping that the USDA comes up with a better plan and better regs because they know the current plan just is not workable and is not good mm. with all the DEA labs and the testing. So I, I think this is one of those wait and see situations it's it's tough to say i mean you know i think the department of ag has been really good we are as a state i don't know if you guys realize this how fortunate we are in our ag department what they've done for us this year um there's other states who have adopted the usda regs with and 
they're, they might be in, the farmers might be in trouble once testing protocols come in and DEA labs and the whole thing is a disaster. And so our Department of Ag really went out on a limb to continue our research, uh, the research program mm -hmm. instead of adopting that program. So they really gave us a whole nother growing season um, without putting us at risk, mm -hmm. uh, which is huge. Uh, and we're so thankful that they did that. I don't know, I don't think they know what's gonna happen October 31st. And I think we've all seen the USDA's um, kind of slowness, not only to move on hemp, but with COVID, I mean, they're barely moving on food assistance programs. You know, we have the supply chain is in pieces across the country. They can't even address that. I don't see them really coming back to the hemp situation in any um, kind of salient way. Yeah, so one thing, a comment that's coming through uh, from Dennis saying uh, his concern is that if there's not a plan submitted to feds, New York growers uh, won't be able to ship across state lines. Um, I don't, I'm just reading this, I don't know all of it off the top of my head from a regulation perspective, saying right now farmers can sell the processors in other states as long as they, there's an approved plan for their state. So I'm wondering if that is something we're, we're worried about. I'm not, personally as a grower and a processor, no, not worried about that at all. I don't, I don't see any real uh, enforcement on that this year, whether or not we have a plan and we can ship out of state. I don't think that's going to be a problem. As long as you're, if you're shipping out of state though, and you're shipping to a state that has adopted total THC testing and your crop is above that number, then you might have a problem. That's, that's where you might have a problem, but just um, selling to another processor in another state should probably be fine. Mm. Um, one question that hasn't been answered, and uh, this can be for both of y'all. Um, what is the probability of, uh, you know, the assembly leader, Crystal People Stokes, is, is still believes the possibility of pushing uh, adult use in this session um, on a scale of one to 10 you think it's it's dead for this year and let's keep moving forward for next year um i don't you you can <laughs> simple nod <laughs> it works but if you want to yeah answer. i mean that that's my assumption but you know anything's possible at this point considering the uh how desperate we are right now for revenue but that wouldn't clock in for this year anyway but i i think the the revenue issue might honestly bring this thing forward along with a lot of other things we, we've been mm -hmm. looking at doing but yeah, it's it's difficult to get 105 of us on a Zoom call, let alone, you know, try to sort out how to move this thing forward. But, you mm -hmm. know, she and I are gung-ho, as you might realize. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Zach, there was a quick question or a comment about none of processors in New York. We hear this oh a gosh. lot. It's just simply not true. There is so much processing capacity in New York for hemp extract right now, and more people are just keep opening up. Mm -hmm. um, the issue is not that there's not enough processing capacity in New York. I just would like to say that I know tons of processors who have openings in their facilities. Mm. The issue is what Donna had brought up from the beginning. There's nowhere to sell the oil. There's no point in processing a crop if you do not have a market for it. Mm. That's really the crux of the problem. Mm. Um, and that will be the problem for another year or so, you know, because people grew on speculation and the market is just not there yet. The FDA has not allowed food and beverages. New York has not allowed food and beverages yet. And until that happens, there will be an oversupply and the, and that's the bottleneck. Um, but there are tons of processors and if someone needs a processor, they can contact me. I can recommend multiple people in New York state that can turn your crop around, whether it's ethanol or CO2, distillate, whatever you're looking for. Um, right. th they are everywhere. There's people who've invested millions of dollars in every part of the state into processing facilities. I've seen a bunch of them. I know what their capacity is. So. Um, Alan, just a quick question. Um, to who, people who are storing, are they, you know, this is just my ignorance on this, are they better off processing it or are they better off keeping it, storing it? You know, we've seen, we've seen hemp in storage last a year with very little degradation. So I think from, if you have proper storage and you've dried the crop correctly and you don't have high humidity and you're not letting it freeze and thaw a lot of times, um, storage is okay. 
but it's definitely will store for years once you get it turned into oil, which is the better option for sure. Gotcha. But also an, it's an expensive option. Um, mm. when a lot of people built processing facilities, not just in New York, but around the country, you know, mm. the market for oil was almost 10 times the price of what it is today. And so a lot of people built really expensive facilities and um, a lot of people around the country are going bankrupt. Four Kentucky processors has gone bankrupt in like the last six months because they overbuilt. And so I think we're just going to have to all find a balance to get crops processed and stored and grow a little bit less this year. Um, and wait till the market rebounds. And so on that on that note, you know, we talked, Donna, I really appreciate you bringing up the point of the cost because um, right now, you know, costs are exceptionally high for tincture. Uh, you know, you can see 1600 migs, which is a gram and a half you know, going for 100 in some cases, or even 80. Um, whereas, uh, I'm curious, Alan, what you're, or both of you, if you have perspective, forecasting what more of a consumer-friendly price point will be. Um, of course, we also see the, pro the the cost of processing, tolling, and bottling dropping, which is going to help offset the cost of the purchase off downstream to the consumer. Um, mm -hmm. But curious if you have any projections or assumptions uh, of where that range might be more affordable for people. Um. I don't know what the range that will be affordable for people. I mean, we try to sell our products at reasonable prices, but I don't come from consumer packaged goods. And now that I'm in it selling to, you know, Wegmans and distributors, um, I can take a $10 tincture. By the time it gets to the consumer at Wegmans, it's 50 bucks plus because their markups are insane when, a, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, from the distributor to the grocery store, the grocery store doubles the price, whatever they're buying it for. If yeah. they buy your tincture for $25, they're selling it for 50 yeah. mm -hmm. every time. I mean, that's just their margin. So I think, um, in a product like this, you know, it's even Nike shoes. I mean, they cost a dollar to make, you're still paying a hundred dollars for them. Mm -hmm. So I think this is where farmers are and the consumers are a little upset is the, the markups along the supply chain are huge. And I think just like with food, the best place for consumers to get a reasonably priced product and high quality is to go to the farmer's markets and shop at your local stores, because that's really where people will be able to buy those tinctures that are like $75 at the grocery store for like 40 bucks at, from directly from the farmer. And so we're really needing to get to that point, I think, um, sooner than later. Yeah, maybe that's something for the, the, you know, for the work group or NYCGPA to begin to look at how marketing and branding of the industry can develop that, you know, someone said, don't build another dairy business model or, you know, direct consumer is the way to go, cut out the middlemen, you know, mm -hmm whether it's a blend of those, like how, um, you know, promoting the strong and growing farm to table movement that we see and, and, and desire for local or regional. I think that's, uh, that's part of the overall marketing campaign for an industry. So it's something worth, worth thinking about mm -hmm. and how to incorporate that in, as we build from the start. Um, I'm, look, I'm looking at uh, timing and I would like to give Jason, uh, you know, enough time to begin looking at the, the COVID relief um, specifically from the agriculture perspective, but we'll give, if anyone has any burning questions, uh, we got another couple minutes um, if that's there, but otherwise um, we'll transition. I'll give people a moment to think. Yeah, that's a good question. How do we incentivize local through economic development? Those are good questions. I and mean, those are big questions, big, you know, statewide strategy, regional strategy, industry specific strategy. Um, and that's where I think, uh, you know, platforms like this, we can continue to, to hopefully brainstorm those things. Mm -hmm. mm. Definitely. Uh, just uh, to that point, uh, every region has been tasked with coming up with the, what the governor refers to as a reimagining plan. And I'm inserting this conversation into every one of those discussions. Mm. We're going to reimagine our agriculture. And we finally realized what is at stake when the food supply chain is disrupted then we have to make sure that uh, hemp and all of its uh, forms are uh, part of that conversation. So mm -hmm. that's what I'm working on. Appreciate that, Donna. Mm -hmm. um, well, I can't thank you both. Feel free to stick around if you, uh, but just before we transition, yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate your time this morning and um, 
you know, you're, this is informing my personal decisions, let alone, you know, the group that's on this and we will be sharing this recording. So it's just, it's really helpful if we can get on the same page and, uh, you know, having two industry leaders and experts helping us uh, in our, you know, in developing our perspective is really essential. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Great. Um, and then, yeah, Jason, I will unmute you. Thanks, Zach. And thanks, Alan and Donna. That was great. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the federal legislation on COVID uh, to help small businesses. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll try, I'll talk, try to talk a little bit about agriculture, but to the, there really honestly isn't that much to be said from the federal side. Um, there was like 19 billion that was dedicated towards agricultural help. Um, but, and they did try to insert that hemp farmers would be protected um, or would be, have availability for some of the federal funds. Um, in terms of things like the Paycheck Protection Program and things like that, I think it's more of a trial and error, um, luck of the draw kind of thing, with, especially when you look at CBD in particular, um, because I can analogize this to really the only time I've had to de deal with this at a federal level was when we tried to trademark a CBD company. And the US Patent and Trademark Office came back to us and said, unless you're an FDA approved pharmaceutical, we are basing our decision on the inability to trademark CBD products because it's, according to the FDA, illegal under the FDNC Act, and therefore we do not trademark illegal products. And that was pushed back. We just got that guidance uh, a couple of months ago after eight months of waiting. So we don't know how this plays out for Paycheck Protection Program because the Paycheck Protection Program right in its legislation says it is unavailable for federally illegal businesses. It cut cannabis businesses right out of the legislation, um, THC cannabis businesses. Um, ironically, many cannabis businesses in many states were designated as essential and there is a disconnect, but that's because one is governed by federal law, one is governed by state law. And just because a state says a business is essential doesn't mean the federal government's gonna recognize that. So, um, you know, we, we encourage everybody to try to apply for the PPP loans if they're um, eligible for them and to try maybe smaller community banks. Um, they have been more flexible. Uh, you know, if you're applying to Chase Bank or something like that, that, that's a huge bank. They're dealing with big companies. They've, there's been news that they've dedicated some of these loans to, you know, multi-million dollar companies. Uh, where there's been some anecdotal reports that the smaller community banks have actually helped out some uh, hemp businesses. But so far, we, we don't really have any real guidance on that. And the, even if you contact the SBA um, at the federal level, the SBA is pointing you to the local offices. The local offices are pretty much telling us, we don't know, this is evolving on a daily basis, check back with us. Um, and then the banks are the ones who are administering the loans. So it's really just discussing things with a bank, seeing if they're going to approve and things like that. So uh, with that being said, you know, I'll talk a little bit more generally about the COVID legislation. So as I mentioned, the Paycheck Protection Program, it's available to all businesses with 500 or fewer employees. Um, the first round of like $350 billion went in like three days. Um, they reauthorized that, then the system crashed. Uh, so we'll see how long it's available now. Um, but it is recommended that if you had, if you are self-employed, if you're independent contractor, or you, you know, you have a business with 500 or less employees apply because these loans are really, really good. If you manage to keep the same amount of employees measured between, uh, I think it's February 15th and April 26th, all the way until June 30th your loans are totally forgivable. Um, so if you get $100,000 to, and, but the loans do have to be used to cover things like uh, salaries, mortgage, rent, things like that. 
Um, but if you get these loans, they are completely forgivable as long as you maintain um, the level of employees. They don't even have to be the same employees. Um, it's just you had, if you had 10 employees during the measuring period, you have to have 10 employees by June 30th. Um, they, so the Paycheck Protection is probably the most beneficial loan right now because it is completely forgivable. Um, if you don't have employees, sometimes like real estate falls into this where, you know, you own real estate, but you don't really have employees for that, you're not really going to be able to get the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, you do also have to have an active trader business. So um, there's something called the Economic Injury Disaster Loans, that's EIDL loans. Um, they're for businesses with 500 less 500 employees or less, they are more traditional loans um, and they can be used for any kind of purpose for the business, payroll, fixed debts, accounts payable, other bills that can't be paid because of a disaster. Um, it's not just for salary. Uh, these are up to $2 million loans and you can get an emergency advance of 10,000. Although because the programs have been hit so hard, um, what they're doing, what I anecdotally heard, um, is that these loans are kind of doing a thousand dollar advances or a thousand dollars per employee or something like that up to ten thousand um, the loan terms are relatively favorable you get a 3.75 percent fixed rate if you're a for-profit business 2.75 if for nonprofits um, you there's no personal guarantee on the loans for less than if the loans up to two hundred thousand dollars if it's more than two hundred thousand they would require a personal guarantee um, and there's the, you get a one year deferral on payments. And um, so that, so again, it's more of a traditional type of loan, but it's still beneficial. Um, so now we'll get kind of into, if you can't get the loans, um, another alternative is tax credits. Um, so there's a few tax, a couple of tax credits at issue and they are ex mutually exclusive. So if you get one, you can't get the other but there's a coronavirus sick leave tax credits. So if you have employees that left work for either they were told to isolate, they have coronavirus symptoms, they're caring for somebody with coronavirus symptoms, um, you can get up to 100% or they can get up to 100% reimbursement for up to 80 hours of work um, from the federal government and the employer can receive a refundable sick leave tax credit for up to $5,110 uh, $5, or $511 per day. Um, so that helps employers because the tax credits on the employer side are 7.6% like or something like that. Um, so it's, it's good to get a little bit um, of the money back and they're paid quarterly. So you know, you will actually get some money this year from that. Um, let's see what else. So there's also the employment retention tax credit. Um, and this is available for up to 50% of the tax credit, up to $10,000, meaning each uh, employee you can get $5,000 for. Um, and this is basically, you just have to, it's available to um, employees, employers with less than 100 employees, all the employees are eligible. If you have more than 100 employees, it's only available for the employees who are not working, but still being paid. Um, and if you get a PPP loan or a paid sick leave tax credit, you can't, you can't get the employee retention tax credit. But again, this is another mechanism to hopefully get some uh, money back into the hands of small businesses. Um, and the last thing federally that I'll talk about, which um, doesn't actually help anybody in 2020, it will only help you in 2021, is um, under the previous tax legislation in 2017, they basically got rid of net operating loss carry back, meaning you had a profit or if you had a loss this year, you used to be able to carry that loss back and net it against profits in the past. You couldn't do that anymore. Um, they actually allow now you can go back five years and um, carry your loss back from 2020 
all the way back to uh, 2015. So um, the issue with that is, you, unless you're a corporation who has a uh, calendar year end or a fiscal year end in 2020, um, or earlier than you know December 31st, you're you're not going to be able to recognize any of this until let's call it April of 2021. So it doesn't really help at all for 2020 right now. Um, but it is something available. Uh, it also does come with a small benefit too that um, you're accruing losses in a 30, like let's just take the maximum tax brackets for a second. If you're a pass through, um, you're accruing losses at a 37% tax rate, but you can apply those losses against profit that was taxed at 39.6%. So you get a little arbitrage there. It's good, but again, doesn't help for 2020. It's only gonna help in 2021. Um, so those are kind of the federal programs that are available. Uh, the funding comes and goes. It's best to get on the list. So even if you've, you're reading things that the funding isn't available, um, get on the list because they, they keep a, a tally and a queue so that as the funding becomes available, you will start to get um, notice. And if you're approved, then you get into line with everybody else to get the funds. So it's good to know that these programs are out there. Talk to your local banks, talk to the SBA, look at the guidance. Um, also make sure that when you're looking online, you're looking at the governmental websites. So sba.gov, irs.gov, treasury.gov. Those are where they're posting the most up-to-date resources. They post their final guidances there. Um, and realistically, you look on those sites, you can answer most of your questions. Sometimes you're gonna get these like crazy questions that literally nobody knows the answer to because they haven't thought about it yet. Um, but a lot of guidance is out there for this. Um, and it is helpful, but especially if you can qualify for the uh, PPP loans because they're, they're, forgiv they're forgivable. So it's, it's kind of like the government just handing over money um, as long as you keep your uh, employees. So, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions on that or anything else. Um, you know, just shoot a, shoot a question. I appreciate that. Um, Dennis asks, could you compile a few quick links on this, please, and follow up an email? That's something that uh, you and I can work together. Jason, I can send out over the listserv. Mm -hmm. um, also, Alan, um, if you're open to that, there was a question about uh, you know, other processors and you could do that directly. I don't know if it works best to send it out as a list or, or work to collab to combine something as a resource, but uh, that's just another request I'm remembering at this um, moment. Yeah, for the, uh, the links for the PPP program, I will say that uh, there's a lot of good ones. So you guys, if you don't have to do the work, um, New York Farm Bureau, New York Farm Bureau has been doing a really good job of compiling all of that link data for people for the PPP program and the economic uh, disaster loan. So those are definitely um, they're probably even on the Farm Bureau website. They got some good stuff there though. Right. And then what was the processor question? Oh, um, there was a question about uh, a list of other processors who might or any processors who might have availability for processing right now. Um, yeah, that is I've heard again and again, and whether you want to take it directly, if it's uh, a list we could compile um, and share with the listserv, then either or, but happy to have people oh, reach out. That's a good idea. Zach, maybe we'll do it offline later and we'll just put together a list of the people that we know are operating actually at New York State standards and have capacity and maybe could uh, email that out or something. Absolutely. Cool. And um, yeah, so if anyone has any specific questions about the PPE, uh, you know, or what Alan's spoken of, we're happy to serve as a direct channel. Um, you know, we can, Jason's been more than available on so many questions I've had as a business owner uh, myself. So it just, he's a great resource to, to help dig in. Um, and yeah, we're gonna, we'll send a, there's, I'm gonna try something. When we exit out, we're getting close to the 10 o'clock. Um, give a thumbs up or thumbs down on how you felt that the uh, webinar went today. It should be when you leave that you, you get a little bit of a feedback. Um, I, we want to keep trying to do this uh, networking aspect where we can continue to meet who's in our community. I think it's a really valuable and maybe we'll have maybe like hemp lab socials uh, where we can all be sitting at home drinking, uh, you know, our ice cream sundaes or, or a beer, whatever, and, and getting to know each other more. Cause that's really what I think makes the industry drive forward. 
Um, if you haven't already, I'm sending a link right now into uh, the chat. Um, so again, we're a member-based organization and we're 501c3. So, you know, we're any support, if you feel inspired to join or uh, even just donate, um, that resource is now in a link in here. We'll send it out, but just we appreciate it. Thanks to all the members who are on this call today. Uh, again, your funds are helping us pay for this Zoom itself and it goes a long way. Um, we're here for, for questions um, moving forward. And yeah, I really thank you, Jason. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Donna, uh, for your time this morning. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to doing this more in the future. If you have any questions or if you want to, really what you want to learn about, please just message us. We want to bring, we want to support the stakeholders by bringing the experts to the table, uh, whether it's a, a, you know 10 people are on this call or 100. Um, it's valuable to keep the conversation going. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it if anyone has any remaining questions. Um, but again, thank you to our speakers. Okay, really, really grateful for that. And uh, cool. Well, that's awesome. Um, we will see you all soon. And uh, yeah, stay in touch and stay, stay healthy and stay safe and try to enjoy some, some sunshine when it peeks through. We'll talk to you all soon. Take care.